Who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation continually say, The Lord is great. Let's say that together. And now, wait, wait, wait. And I don't want to be like again louder. Let's say, The Lord is great. Let's say it. The Lord is great. Amen. You believe that this morning? Are you rejoicing in Him? We're so glad that you joined us for the services uh, this morning at Brian Bible Church, whether you're here in person or you're following us online. I also was told this morning that it's Pastor Jeff's birthday. Is that true? Today's your birthday? What are you, 60 now? <laughs> 54. Okay, he just acts like he's 60. All right. Happy birthday, Jeffrey. Okay, there we go. A uh, co- couple announcements before we... Uh, move along into our uh, work back to worship again. Uh, how about joining a small group if you're not part of one or you're interested in them? There are sheets on the back table, or you can speak to one of the staff, and we'll try to get you hooked up in a small group if you'd like to. Of course, Easter is fast approaching, so don't forget all the special things that happen at Easter. One of them is there's an Easter egg hunt uh, on uh, Saturday, April the 9th from 9 to 11. Uh, I'll be there for that. Uh, because I'd like Easter eggs. Um, oh, no, wait, it says it's for nursery to fifth grade, so I guess I won't be allowed to participate in that. Uh, does it count if you bring a, grand, a grandchild and let them do it, and you kind of, like, help them a little? You can do that? Okay. So maybe I will be there. Uh, don't forget the Easter services. We have a Good Friday service on uh, Friday the 15th at 7 p.m. Then the cantata is Saturday night, at, uh, se- at uh, 7 p.m. as well. And then our Easter s- uh, Sunday service is on the 17th. We have a sunrise service at 7. We have breakfast right after that. Uh, we have our 9 o'clock, um, uh, our regular Sunday school classes, and then 10.30 service. There will be no evening service on uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, also, a reminder to start thinking ahead uh, about our new Sunday school classes. Uh, which are, are going to be, uh, begin the first uh, Saturday in April, April 3rd. Uh, we change, so if you, uh, you're going to move from one uh, adult Sunday school to another. Of course, if you haven't been out, this would be a good time to get in on week number one. Every 13 weeks, uh, we uh, uh, change some classes. A couple of them do roll right through, but most of them change after uh, 13 weeks. Then the final announcement I have is that on April 23rd, we're going to have... Uh, Christian women in law uh, that uh, 
a seminar here from 8 in the morning to 11.30. That's Saturday, April the 23rd. Uh, they had this up uh, to sign up online. And uh, you know that there are enemies out there. They got like 90 fake emails and how to shut the whole thing down. Uh, so there are enemies out there. They're going to have to retool that. Uh, but please put that on your calendars. Uh, the speaker is going to be Marcy Topol. I don't know who she is. Uh, Actually, that's my sister. She's a retired state representative. She'll be one of the speakers. And then Judge Cheryl Allen is also going to speak. You can register here. I don't know that you can this morning. They're just going to have to retool the whole thing. But be in prayer. We have to get that word out now. It can't go out online uh, because people have hacked into it and destroyed the whole thing. Uh, there are enemies of the cross everywhere. So uh, pray about that. Uh, come out. I know it'll be a, a good morning in spite of my sister. Uh, so come. Come and join her. No, actually, my sister, uh, I'll go over her message with her so she doesn't mess anything up. She's much more well-spoken than I, actually. So, uh, You ready to go, Nick? You're contemplating my sister over there? <laughs> you're, you're trying to think of something to say good about my sister and bad about me, right? <laughs> okay, let's, go, let's worship the Lord. How about we pray? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the many gifts and opportunities you give us to be able to come and learn together, but not just with our head, but with our hearts, that we continue to learn to uh, your scriptures, that we can love you more and love each other more uh, and recognize our need for a Savior. And that's not something we just recognized one time when we came, became members of your family, but we continue to recognize that throughout our life as we look to that final salvation will be made one with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I got some exciting news over the course of the past, I'd say three weeks, we'll be conservative. Uh, the past three weeks, we've heard of uh, four different people in, around here that got saved because of the ministry that you guys have been uh, a part of. I think you need to stand up and welcome to the family. Okay, so I just said four people got saved, and I heard I, there was more applause when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, okay? I'm going to try this again. Four people got saved! Okay, even if it was fake, that was more like it. So we're going to uh, thank God for this amazing gift as we sing the song we've been learning for a few weeks. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. That river of life wash it all the way. If you've been searching, carrying burdens, if you've been lost and looking for a home, if you've been drifting, something's missing, you should know that you are not alone. Waste. Open your heart, don't be afraid, jump on in, the water is fine, there's a healing in the river of life, come as you are, no time to waste, open your heart, don't be afraid, jump on in, the water is fine, there's a healing in the river of life, brothers, sisters, come on down to that river, guaranteed you'll never be the same.
Our scripture for this morning comes from Luke chapter 16. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man who was manager, a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called on each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he answered the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager when he, because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed in eternal dwellings. So whatever God has given us, it's up to us to use it for Him with the eternal mindset. Continue to stand, but you may be seated if needed as we sing. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be.
verse before you sing it. When it says, take my will and make it thine. Don't sing this if you don't mean it. But understand when you're giving God over your will, that means you're going to do whatever he wants you to do. So many times we uh, hold on to, he would never, he would never change my will. Well, if we're a good Christian, we're ones that want to follow after him. We have to set our wills to what he wants. Take my will. If you consider yourself new at Marine, you probably don't know this one as, as well. This is our last song before the message because we sang all these songs about him taking our will, him taking our money, whatever it is, taking our voice. Those are the things that if you try to rely on your own strength to get them, to do them, you're just going to fail. And so instead, we have to realize every day we have to bow our will to his. So this is a Christian's daily prayer, a reminder of the attitude we should have every day.
things that you've given us in our lives, so freely given, that we learn to give it back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Okay, once again, thank you guys for uh, leading us before the throne of grace and preparing our hearts to hear the word of God. Uh, before we uh, get to that passage of scripture that uh, Nick read for us, we do have a couple of memberships that we would uh, like to recognize here today. Uh, so, uh, I mean, is uh, Pastor Jace back there anywhere? Is he, uh, is he there? Ready? There he is. He's ready to go. By the way, I think his sister might actually be the best uh, speaker in the family. <laughs> That's true. So the first uh, ones that we want to recognize from you today, I mean, Bob and Joan Campbell, where are they at? I think they're back there on that uh, side there. You guys want to stand up for us? Where are you at? There they are right there. I'd like to welcome you guys to, uh, to membership in Berean Bible Church. And then we also want to recognize uh, Justin Taylor and Grace Warrenack, and they're up here, you mean, in the front? You mean, I do believe, so you guys want to stand up? I can welcome you guys into membership as well. And uh, they have an up-and-coming wedding real soon, too, so be in prayer for them. I mean, it's always a stressful time. And so, again, if you would, uh, you know, like to, uh, or if you are interested in joining, you mean, Berean Bible Church as a member, uh, I mean, we can uh, see me, you mean, or one of the pastors, one of the elders, and uh, we'll get you hooked up with just what that process looks like. It's relatively painless. Uh, basically, all you need to do is give clear testimony that you know Christ, I mean, as your Savior. So uh, with that, I mean, let's uh, look at uh, God's Word here today. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 16, our message uh, this morning is entitled Portfolio Planning. Now, we begin with this. What was the most uh, outrageous thing, you mean, that you would do for $10,000 in cash? Well, that was a question that was posed recently by a Chicago radio station, which attracted responses from more than 6,000 full-tilt crazies. The eventual winner, uh, Jay Gwaltney of Zionsville, Indiana, who consumed an 11-foot birch sapling, leaves, root, roots, bark, and all for the event. Now, when he showed up, you I mean he donned a tuxedo and dined at a table set elegantly with uh, china, sterling silver, candles, and even a rose vase. Armed with pruning shears, the Indiana State University sophomore, sophomore began chomping from the top of the tree and worked this all the way, branch by branch, to the roots. His only condiment, French dressing. For the massive birch leaf salad, you mean that he inevitably had to eat. The culinary feat took him over 18 hours over a period of three days. When it was all over, Gwaltney complained of an upset, upset stomach. Evidently, the bark was worse than his bite. <laughs> guys, nothing but the best quality humor for you guys up here, man. I, I spare no expense. I search the internet far and wide for stuff like that. You know, money plays a large role in our daily lives. It's uh, estimated that money occupies almost 70% of our conscious thought. Did you know that 40% of Jesus' parables deal in some way or have an element, I mean, involving financial resources? That the Bible contains 500 verses on prayer and faith, but over 2,000 verses, Old and New Testaments, that address dealing with money. Pretty crazy stuff. You know, money is necessary in life. And it itself is morally neutral. Money is not evil in and of itself. It all depends on your attitude toward it. It's not a sin to be well-off financially, nor is it noble to be poor. Money is a stewardship responsibility given to each one of us, whether we have a lot or whether we have a little. Four things you mean to remember. Number one, whatever you have, however much it is, God has given it to you. He's given you the ability to make it, the skills, the training, the job, the opportunity, the health, the strength, all of it. Number two, everything you have belongs ultimately to God who gave it to you. Number three, what I do with my financial resources reflect the values in my heart. And number four, one day I will have to give an account of how I managed what God had entrusted to me. Those four thoughts. 
Now, the Bible, again, it does not condemn, I mean, uh, you know, money or, you know, someone who is interested in money or handles money or even who has a lot of money. But rather, consistently, the message of the Bible is, is that it is the love of money that is the root, I mean, of all kinds of evil, the Scripture says. Not money itself, but rather the love of money. We're reminded by the Lord Jesus that a man's life does not necessarily consist of the sum of his possessions. You're more than your financial resources. Life is about more than that. Now, I want to take a look here at what some prominent people throughout the country's history, very wealthy you know, folks, have said you mean, about money. I have made many millions, but they brought me no happiness. You know who said that? John W. Rockefeller, the richest man in the world. The care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. That was W.H. Vanderbilt. I am the most miserable man on earth. John Jacob Astor said that. How about this one? I was happier when I was doing a mechanics job, Henry Ford. And Andrew Carnegie said this, that millionaires seldom smile. If we violate the scriptural command, you mean, and we love money, we can find ourselves like the person you mean, who spends all of his time, you mean, energy and talent climbing the ladder of success only to find out that it was leaning against the wrong wall. Let's take a look then at this parable. It's a wonderful story. As always, we need to take a look at a little bit of a background, uh, you know, a little some background information here. Um, linguistically, I mean, this is the, you know, this is the same, an, an, out, uh, an outpouring of the same story, I mean, that we saw in Luke chapter 15, the lost parables. It's the same occasion. It's a chapter division in your Bible, but you mean, you know, just don't read it that way. Continue to read the same story. The same audience is being addressed. The disciples are there. The Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes are there as well. As they listen, you mean, to the teaching that's being, you know, provided here. Now, the thing that ties these stories together is in the final one of the lost parables, we can see that the lost son was guilty of squandering his father's, uh, you mean, inheritance that had been given to him. And in this passage, we see the unrighteous manager is one who squandered his master's possessions. And so that's what sort of ties these two stories together. But the target audience here, I mean, for this particular parable, is going to be the disciples. People, you mean, that were followers of Jesus. And so this has extreme value here to us. We read in the first couple of verses, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. And so he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be a manager. Now, these, uh, these managers here, you mean, the, the, uh, the actually the word for manager here has the word, uh, the, the Greek word house inside of it. Um, and it was someone who ran in the household for an extremely, you know, wealthy person. They managed all of the business affairs because, you mean, the, uh, the, you know, the rich owner had, you know, more, you know, more pressing matters to be about. And so they uh, would hire, I mean, a person who was a steward who would go out and who would you know, basically run I mean, the master's businesses for him. He would keep an account of the books. He would uh, you know, make uh, trades and uh, you know, make purchases and sell things. And basically all of the estate was entrusted to this manager. And so therefore these positions were coveted you mean, in the ancient world and very common amongst the rich and powerful. In fact, these positions were so well sought after uh, that um, you would actually sell yourself into an indebted servitude to that master for the sake of being able to do that job. That's how important these positions were, how rare they were. They required someone you mean, who had some degree of education, someone who had tremendous organizational skill and ability, someone who had intelligence, someone who was good at record keeping, and someone who was extremely good at math. So basically, I'm out. Okay? You don't want me doing that job, that's for sure. You don't want me anywhere near that thing. But those are some of the skills that you needed to be an effective manager. And so this particular fellow, for whatever reason, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how this happened, but, you I mean, the Scripture says that he had squandered his master's possessions. Now, that word squandering, even here in the Greek, is an interesting word. It literally means to toss up in the air. And the background here is of, you know, I mean, when they would do uh, uh, harvesting the grain, they would do uh, winnowing of that grain. 
uh, where once it was separated, you know, from the, uh, from the stalk, they would begin throwing it up in the air after it was crushed. And the little, uh, the little outside coating, I mean, on the seed, either wheat or barley, would blow away then in the wind. And so you would toss the grain up in the air, and the chaff would blow away. Literally, that's the word here, I mean, for his mismanagement. He threw up into the wind his master's money, his master's financial possessions, his commodities. And so the game was now up, though. The master had found out about this, and so he calls him into account. He asks him to come and to be able to open, I mean, the books. There was going to be an accounting. There was no more hiding, you know, what had happened. His master, I mean, was, was, was asking him here that you're going to have to tell me, you know, where all of this, you know, money went. Now, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, this, that this, uh, you know, rich person, you I mean, this rich master, he was very concerned about money. He may even have been a lover of money. He was a very frugal individual. Now, those of you that live in this area should understand this, right, because this is part of the culture here. In fact, some of you may be reminded you mean, of the story that there was a Frenchman, an Italian, and a Pennsylvania Dutchie all sitting in a, in, a, in a coffee shop enjoying a nice coffee. It was in the middle of summer, and there were all kinds of flies around and everything, and so uh, a fly had, 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 had flown into the Frenchman's cup of coffee. Well, he said, I can't drink this, and he got up, and he threw the whole cup of coffee out. Then a fly lands in the Italian's cup of coffee, and he fishes the fly out of there. I mean, pours a little bit of it out, and then drinks the rest. And then a fly flew in the Pennsylvania Dutch guy's, uh, you know, coffee. And so he looked in there, and he went in, and he fished out the fly, and he looked at him, and he started shaking him like this, and he went, spit it out, spit it out. But the master has called this man into account. It's time for you to show me, I mean, what you've done here. And so... We now see in verses 3 through 4, we see an internal soliloquy here. We get a a window into the man's thoughts. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. He was in a pickle. He said, I'm not strong enough to dig. He was wholly unsuited physically for that job, and the digging is probably in the field, you know, plowing and hoeing and all the things that were necessary. Because, you know, now he had been disgraced, you know, as a manager. No one else was going to hire him in this position. And, you mean, he was too ashamed to beg. You mean, he's you know, too proud, you mean, to be able to do that. And so, you mean, he's not going to participate in any of those activities. And so he finally says, hey, listen, I, I know what I'm going to do, verse 4. I know what I'll do. So when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses, probably, you mean, as, uh, you mean, a servant or some kind of position like that. And so, you mean, he concocts, I mean, this plan. He was going to do some favors for some of the master's clients so that when he lost his job, he was going to have some chips out there, right? Because if you did a favor for somebody in the ancient world, you were in their debt. Because the whole idea, you mean, of keeping, you know, your word, of, you know, of making promises and, you know, you, know, uh, you know, paying back good for good and evil for evil, that was ingrained in the ancient world. That was so prominent in thinking. You know, if you, if you had someone do you a solid favor, you I mean, you had to repay that. Like, you mean, absolutely you were obligated to do so. You were in that person's debt until you could follow through with it. This guy understood the culture in which he lived, and he plans to be able to use that for his advantage. So now, I mean, we're given here two debtors. They're just two as a sample. You mean two examples here, you mean, of, uh, you mean, of the, the folks that dealt, I mean, with the, the rich uh, owner's goods. We have that, uh, you know, here for us in verse 5. And so he called in each one of his master's, collect, or her, each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and make it 400. And then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? Ten, or it says a thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, take your bill and make it 800. So these two debtors are given to us here, I uh, mean, as an example of what kind of business I mean, the master did. He dealt in commodities. He was a wholesaler. 
And he dealt with large, large, large amounts. And these people would probably come, you mean, to this, uh, this servant's master to be able to, you know, make these contracts and set these deals. And he had the power to write them, and he had the power to rewrite them. They were contractual obligations. They were covenants. And most likely the way this worked is that uh, there was a credit system. And so these folks, you mean, had taken possession of the oil, you mean, and the wheat, uh, you mean, on credit. I mean, with a promise to repay, I mean, in the future. But before they were able to repay, before they were able to move and, 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 and get the money to pay back, the servant is able to say to them, hey, let's, let's sit down, let's look at these contracts, let's look at these, uh, look at these debts. First one, you mean, the oil, the oil here is a very large amount, and it's worth, you mean, about, a, about three years' wages for a day laborer. And the wheat was worth about seven years' wages for a day laborer. So we're talking about large amounts of product here. Very, very, very valuable assets. The oil was discounted 50%, while the wheat was discounted 20%. Now, I read that in a book because I couldn't actually do the math myself. And so now, I mean, you know, the, the, this, uh, these deals are done. And again, he's hoping that, I mean, by doing these folks this favor of reducing, I mean, their, uh, the amount that they owed, that this is going to, you know, earn him some friends, earn him some future possibilities. I mean, he's, he's securing, you mean, his, uh, his future employment or occupation here. That's what he's doing. And so then, I mean, we read, I mean, in the story, I mean, that the, ma- the, the, uh, the manager told him, you know, or, or in the story here in verse, uh, in verse 8, that the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Now, this brings us into some difficulty. Like, what, what is, you know, what, what is going on here? Like, you know, what, what actually happened here? Did, uh, you know, as this guy is discounting these rates, did the, did the manager, you know, cheat the master again with discounting these things? There's two possibilities. I mean, one is that he rewrote the contracts to make the, the amounts less than the market price. That's one possibility. The second possibility that some of the commentators, uh, you know, say is that all that the, uh, that, the, uh, that the manager did was just simply take out his commission, which in the ancient world could have been up to 100%. He took out his cut and said, I'm not going to charge you that. I think it was the first one rather than the second one. It actually discounted, you mean, the price so that the, uh, that the owner or the master you mean, got less than market value. And so here, I mean, once we understand these things, is where, I mean, we have the shocking sort of, you know, knife twist in the story. That thing which stands out and grabs the attention of a person in the ancient world. So the master, you know, shows up, finds out what he's been doing, and what's your expectation? Yeah, your expectation is that the master is going to be like, you know, dude, I'm throwing your rotten carcass in jail. You know, I'm sick of you, man. Like, this is like the second time now, you mean, that you've done me dirty here, right? Like, I, I, this, that's it, man. I'm hauling you off to the Huskow. You're going off to Siberia, man. Like, that's it, man. You're, you're, no one's going to see you again. You're going to be done, man. This is going to be this is going to be over for you. But in a strange twist in the story, when the master shows up, he commends the servant. Now, why does he do this? Is he like you know happy that he was now now you know done dirty two times? Is that is that why he's is that why he's doing this? No. He's not commending, I mean, this man's dishonesty. He's not commanding, he's not commending, I mean, that. But what he is commending is his wise, shrewd actions in securing for himself a future. It's sort of like, you know, when your enemy gets one over on you, you're like, hey, look, I mean, I got to give him that one. I got to give him that one. Okay. Giving the devil his due, so to speak. That's what you see here. Now, the, the application here it comes to us, I mean, in the next couple of verses. So it says, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly or wisely. And he says this, for the people of this world are more shrewd, wise, in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Now, how are we to understand, you know, this expression? Well, first of all, the people of this world are unbelievers. The people of the light are believers. Those are the, those are the two groups of people that are being contrasted, you mean, in this verse. 
For the people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. What he's saying here is that these folks, I mean, that are in the world, that are all consumed you know, with money and, and, and trying to secure, you mean, a, a, a good, you know, f- financial future for themselves. He's saying when this world is all you have, when this world is all you look to, that's all there is for those folks. They do not have a sense of what the ultimate future looks like. Their idea is this, that he who dies with the most toys wins. Hey, I mean, my goal in life is to accumulate as many resources as I can, let my bank accounts grow as fat as they can, to enjoy it, I mean, all the rest of my life, and then I die and that's it. But that's not the way children of the light look at life. Because we're not limited to this world. We understand there's a world to come. That there's another world, that there's a life following death, that God's kingdom is coming upon the earth, that we look forward to a heavenly future. And so we understand that there's something beyond, you mean, just this realm of time where we have to deal with financial resources and money. And so that's his comparison here. Think about how many people, you mean, in this world are very shrewd in their business dealings. You've run up against them, right? You've run up against people who have, you know, I mean, almost, you know, come to the point where they're like willing to cheat you just to get ahead for a few bucks. People who are willing to ruin their reputations just to get a few dollars more. What's worth more, your reputation, you mean, or a couple extra bucks, man? You've all encountered people in businesses that cheat you. People have done you dirty, even friends sometimes that try to end up, you know, making money on you for some strange reason. Why that happens, I have no idea. We've all ran into people like this. Think about, I mean, what runs the entire country? What runs the world? I mean, what's, what's the center of the country? Is it really Washington or is it Wall Street? Because one thing politicians need more than votes is what? Money. Who really controls things? People hold the pocketbook. But think about how much trading is done. How many financial planners and hedge fund managers, I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, folks dealing with bonds and stocks and IRAs and 401ks and mutual funds and all of these things and all this, you know, I mean, emphasis and excessive, you know, uh, you know, details about money and financial resources and making it grow and, you mean, increasing your retirement so that you can one day, you know, settle down and just, you know, ride out your days into the sunset without a financial care as if that was the end of the matter. Oh, that's not the end of the matter. That's just what? The beginning. And so that's his meaning here. For the people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. People that don't know Christ, they're able to do whatever they need to do just to get ahead monetarily. Padding the numbers. Coming up a little short on my tax returns, not really reporting everything I'm supposed to report, anything I can do. And they act very shrewdly and they act very wisely to secure for themselves a happy retirement. Now, what does he say to those that are children I mean, of the light? Take a look at verse 9. I tell you, use Worldly wealth, and some of your versions there have mammon in there, right? You mean just another word for money, really. Use mammon, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. You see, the people of the light understand that this world is not all there is. And that what we do with our resources should reflect the values of heaven. Now, we're not here to build our own kingdoms. We're here to build the kingdom of God. That's got to be our focus. That's got to be this thing that's in the, in, in the prime of our minds. We're told over and over again in, in great verses of Scripture that many of us have memorized. The words of the Lord Jesus, don't store up treasures for yourself here on earth. 
but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because what happens here? Oh, the moth you mean might eat your valuable clothing. Remember, clothing in that day is very expensive. You mean, and, uh, you know, if, that's one of the ways you measured wealth. How many sets of clothes do you have? How fancy were those clothes? You could, they were a store of value in the Old Testament, New Testament time. Or the rust, you mean, eats it away, you mean, you know, or, 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 or whatever happens, you mean, you to, to your wealth. It, it just, it's amazing how many ways money can come to you and how many ways it can fly away from you just that quickly. And we understand that no matter how much we have, we cannot take a cent with us into heaven. Not one of my possessions is going to follow me. There are no U-Hauls in heaven. Can't take it with you. Anything we have is staying here. You know, it was the writer of Ecclesiastes who lamented this in the Old Testament. That a man could be wise. That he could act shrewdly. That he could prepare and plan for the future. That he could amass a great fortune. Only to die <laughs> and to leave it to his rotten son. I mean, who takes over the business and who drives it into the ground and ruins it and squanders all the inheritance. <laughs> That's one of the things that Kohelet the preacher in Ecclesiastes laments about life. And how true is that? One day you're going to leave everything that you currently possess behind to who knows who's going to get it and who knows what they're going to do with it. Whether that person that comes after you will be wise or a fool. We cannot know. But what we can do is take what the Lord has entrusted to us and use it wisely to secure for ourselves a good heavenly welcome. And we do that by taking our financial resources and translating them into souls, one for the kingdom of God. That's the meaning of that phrase right there. Use worldly wealth like the manager did to gain friends so that you will be richly welcome into your eternal dwelling. Now, the argument here is one from the lesser to the greater, and we see this in a lot of Jesus' teachings. It's there in the, in the, uh, in the story of the friend, you mean, who goes to his neighbor at midnight, and he pounds on the door, and the neighbor doesn't really want to get up, but, you know, but by his persistence, he'll get up and he'll answer, and he'll give him the bread that he needs, Right? And the idea there is that even if your neighbor, if you pest them to death, will get up and give you what you want, how much more, that's the lesser, the greater is how much more will your heavenly Father give you what you need, right? Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater. And here in this story, if a dishonest manager who acts wisely to secure his earthly future receives praise from the master, then how much more praise will a believer receive who uses his earthly possessions to secure a rich Welcome in heaven. Make sense? An argument from the lesser to the greater. What we need to do is take what God has entrusted to us and use it, turn that money into souls who can then welcome us into the kingdom of God. Who can richly welcome us into the kingdom of God. Do you look at your resources that way, that all that God has entrusted to you. You know, whenever, you mean, as a church, you know, people start, you know, church leaders or pastors, you mean, start talking about money. I mean, there's always this like, you know, oh, no, you mean, here's the pastor's going to talk to us about like, you know, you know, we need, church needs more money, you know, give more money. You know what? I mean, it's like, whatever you give, man, that's between you and God. But I want to tell you something, that, that once you begin to understand the joy of giving, once you begin to understand the joy of taking your, your money and using that to invest in the lives of people, involve, you know, use that money to invest in, in, in the building of God's kingdom, man, there's no joy like that. You start to have a completely transformed opinion. No Money no longer rules your life. Money was never designed to rule your life. It should never be the thing that drives you forward and, 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 and decides all of your, you know, makes all of your decisions for you. Never to be given that much power in your life. But rather you're to see your financial resources as an opportunity to invest, not in this world, but in the one to come. 
Well, pastor, you mean I, I tithe? I mean, I, I give my you know, 10% to the Lord. That's the Lord's and the rest is mine. No. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all his. It's all his. Whether you have a lot or a little, whatever, wherever you're at, God has entrusted you with something. What you do with your resources, what you do with your money should reflect those heavenly values. To reflect the fact that you're a child of the light. And that one day, you're going to leave this world, and that you can't take a single material possession with you. They're all gone. Job said it best. Naked I came into this world, and naked I shall what? Depart. I'm not taking anything with me. Not carrying anything in my hands. The only thing that I will have there is what I invested in God's heavenly kingdom. Now, somebody once told me in the very beginning of my life, very early days as a Christian young man, they said this, that there are only two things in this world that will last forever. The Word of God and people. Invest your gifts, your time, your talent, your money, your energy in those two things, and you will never regret it. Because that's an investment that pays off in eternity. It lasts beyond the grave. In Revelation, we're told that our works follow us. The things that we did for him, how we used our resources. Now, you I mean, in this, uh, in this you know, broader application, we understand that you've been given the priceless gift of salvation. And you have an opportunity to use what God has given you to reach others. And you can broaden this out, not just your money, but your time, your talents, your gifts, your possessions, all of it. How do you manage your master's resources? That's the question this morning. How are you managing those things? And what kind of welcome will you receive when you step into heaven? When you leave all this stuff behind? I want to welcome up the worship band at this time as well as we sort of, you know, come to the conclusion here this morning. You know, um, in, my, uh, in my family, I had, a, I had an aunt who was, you know, very influential in our, in our family's history. And my aunt was a, a wizard at managing money. She was really, really, really amazing. In fact, she, she taught my mom, you mean, and me, you mean, about, you mean, how to handle it and, and use it wisely and even invest in things like that and save. And, and um, she was a really interesting woman, though, man, because let me tell you something. My aunt Mimi, man, like, you know, she, she, was, she was on the frugal side now. You know what she would do? She would reuse tea bags. You know, the first time, you know, you'd have your hot tea, and then you would save those tea bags, and they would go into the iced tea. My grandfather used to be so angry at that that he would always put milk before he took the tea bag out, just so she couldn't reuse the tea bag. They had like this war going on. She would go to McDonald's with a bottle and take the ketchup packets and squeeze them into the bottle and then take the bottle home. She had soaps that she would buy, bring them down to the basement, put them on a rack, and she would use soap that was 10 years old. She had a 10-year rotation of soap because, you know, it doesn't, if it's old and hardened, it doesn't get that soap scum and it lasts longer. My aunt was frugal. You know, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure where my aunt is spending eternity. She had a lot of money. That was a priority in her life. But it's a poor foundation to build upon. In one of our men's groups, we sort of, uh, have this group time afterwards where we sit around and we talk, and some of the um, some of the group leaders create these questions, you know, for the for the for the guys to discuss. We do the same thing on our Monday Night Freedom Ministry, and one of the questions that you um, I mean was asked one time was, "What do you want people to say about you at your funeral?" That's a great question, and you know, people are saying, "Oh, well, you mean I wanted them to say I'm a godly man? Or I wanted them to say that you mean I, I cared about them, or you mean I was this, or I was that, or you know, whatever that is." But uh, but someone, you mean, in the group said this. 
You know what I want people to say about me at my funeral? Here's what it is. That person led me to Christ. You know, we have no idea when you get to heaven. And, you know, you're, you're there, and, um, you know, the Lord, the Lord knows so much more than we do. He, he sees, like, the, the whole plan of how everything that you did affected everything else. And how like, every part, I mean, he worked together to be able to, you know, to create souls for the kingdom, right? How, how people came to know Christ. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be up there in heaven one day and some kid you don't even know walks up to you and says, hey, you, know, you probably don't know me or remember me, but you taught me the gospel when I was in third grade. And I prayed to receive Christ. Welcome. Or some adult, another nation, another language, another tongue comes up to you and says, you know, you don't know me, but you gave a gift at church one day when a missionary called for needed funds. And that money came, I mean, over to my country, and this missionary shared the gospel with my family, I mean, and, and I'm in heaven because you gave. Or that person that you knew and never thought would amount to anything, but you kept praying for all those years, who one day might walk up to you and say, you know, because you prayed for me and didn't stop praying for me, one day eventually I came to know Christ. I'm here because of you. you know, let what we do with our time and our talents, and yes, our money, reflect the values of heaven. Take what you have and use it, not to build your own kingdom, because, man, that's going to disappear before you know it. But to use it to advance the kingdom of God, which will last forever. And be able to receive that warm welcome as you step into glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this great passage of Scripture. Father, for the encouragement and the challenge that it gives to us. Lord, we know that those who have built their lives upon the foundation of money have been sorely, sorely disappointed, only to find it sifting sand upon the day in which the owner calls them into account. So, Father, we have a different set of values. We have the opportunity to take what you've given to us and to invest it into eternal things that will lead to eternal reward. Or not just here at Berean, but around the world. So many things, so many needs. Lord, let us reflect heaven's values with what we do with our resources. Lord, speak to our hearts in this huge area of Christian living. Lord, we know we need to have some money to be able to live and to pay our own bills, but how big a house do we really need? How big does our bank account really have to be? How much is enough? Howard Hughes said just one dollar more. Guess what? He never, ever, ever found that last dollar. So Lord, the things we do for you last forever. Lord, may we take our resources and turn them into souls for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing, fill my life.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. gave us time again. He gave us too much leftover time. So if you love Jesus and you want to stay, we're going <laughs> to sing one more song. If you don't love Jesus, you can leave. That's fine. But we're going to sing River of Life one more time before we go. Yeah. 
jump on in, the water is fine. It's a healing in the river of life. Come as you are, no time to waste. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. It's a healing in the river of life. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. Father, we thank you for that river of life. We thank you for that blood that was uh, shed on the cross for the remission of sins. We thank you for eternal life that is a free gift from you. We thank you for all the resources you've given us. May may, May we use it to further your kingdom. Give us the will and the mind to do so. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.